Our almighty Father in heaven, once again, we offer you our many thanks because of the life and strength that you continue to give to your children. Despite our many iniquities, faults, and transgressions against you, Father, you have given us this opportunity for us to repent and to be able to prove to you day by day that we continue to love and yearn for you. And Father, please continue to guide us and help us so that we may be worthy once again to follow your teachings and your commandments. Our Father in heaven, please allow us to have an open heart and an open mind. As once again, we listen to your words and your teachings. Allow this Bible study to reach many of your children all over the world, so that it can also help us be enlightened. Allow us to be able to be guided by your truth and the Holy Spirit coming from you. Please bless all of your children who are joining us through the use of this technology so that, Father, all of us will be instruments and beacons of your light and many more will be enlightened by your truth. Our Lord Jesus Christ, continue to help us intercede over all our prayers to the Father so that we will continuously receive the supplications and be granted the forgiveness of our sins. Our Lord God in heaven, we're confident that you have heard our prayers. And you will be con you continue to be with us, not only throughout the whole duration of our Bible study, but throughout the whole duration of our life. For all of these things, we ask and beg in the name of our Lord, Christ Jesus. Amen. Good evening, beloved brothers and sisters, and welcome once again to our Bible study for tonight. Our lesson for tonight is to live in the light. This uh, lesson is based on a letter that we received from info at smallremnant.org, one of our uh, viewers and followers. Uh, next slide. Let me read uh, her letter. Uh, it's in Tagalog, so allow me to read in Tagalog. Kaluwel, kahit po hindi naging mabuting anak at kapatid si Ka Eduardo sa kanyang mga magulang at mga kapatid, naniniwala pa rin ako na mayroon pa rin kabutihang natitira sa kanyang puso at habang may buhay ay may pag-asa pa na siya ay magbago. Sana po sa pagsapit ng kanyang kaarawan ay irigalo sa kanya ng ama ang kababaang loob at kabutihang loob para maituwid ang mga naging pagkakamali niya para na rin sa ikapapayapa ng buong iglesia. Our sister in the faith, um, we just withheld her name. Uh, she's still a member inside the institution who has uh, have been following our Bible studies and worship services, have been constantly communicating with us and uh, sending her questions, comments, and uh, even suggestions. And she's uh, mentioning about the coming birthday of Brother Eduardo V. Manalo. And for those who are still inside the institution under Brother Eduardo V. Manalo, we know that um, the festivities have already begun, meaning service, you'll probably end up um, in a photo op along with all the members, the officers, the ministers, even the district officers, so that you'll all give your greeting to Brother Eduardo B. Manalo. Not only that, a lot of people from different parts of the world are being creative in sending out their 
uh, greetings to Brother Eduardo. Now, our, our sister who sent this letter, um, it's in her heart that even though she knows that Brother Eduardo Bimanalo, according to her letter, has not been a good son or a brother, she still believes that there is some goodness left in his heart. And while there is still uh, life, there is still time, there is still hope that he will change. And it's her fervent hope that um, for the birth date of uh, Brother Eduardo B. Manalo, may God give him as a gift the humility and the goodness so that he may be able to correct his mistakes for the peace of the church. Now, next slide. Everybody celebrating and giving their greetings already to Brother Eduardo B. Manalo. Allow us to also send our greetings to Brother Eduardo B. Manalo. This is um, from one of the Facebook page of the Iglesia de Cristo. Now, unlike uh, other people, especially those who are still inside the institution, even the ministers, whose um, hope for those people they consider as their enemies or those people who are critical of the church administration or even just simply asking questions or trying to expose the corruption and anomalies inside the institution, their hope and prayer will always be for, for us to have a horrible death, perish in life, or receive all the curses written in the Bible. But for us, for Brother Eduardo V. Manalo, and anybody else who may even treat us as their enemies, consider us as the enemies of the chair, church, our fervent hope for anybody who will um, arrive at their birthday would be for them to have good health, long life, and God's blessings. Because regardless of how you may look at us or treat us, we will always consider you somebody that we should love because it's the commandment of our Lord God in heaven. Now, one of the people who posted on their Facebook account, next slide, was uh, very proud to greet Brother Eduardo V. Manalo on his coming birthday. And not only that, um, he said here, isang dekadang pamamahala ng kapatid Eduardo V. Manalo sa loob lamang na sa puntaon ng kanilang pamamahala sa buong Iglesia ni Cristo ay nakapagpatayo ng libu-libong gusaling sambahan. Chapels, repairs, and renovations, 1,117. Barangay chapels, 1,201. Chapels abroad, 107, and so on and so forth. They even made a collage of uh, chapels that uh, were constructed during the time of Brother Eduardo V. Manalo. So, Probably this brother of ours is just really very proud of the accomplishments of Brother Eduardo V. Manalo. Now, like anyone who is a disciple or a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is something that all ministers, shepherds, and those instructed by, in, uh, entrusted by our Lord God to tend to his flock. Our Lord God is expecting something from each and every one of us. Let's find out what that is here in Ephesians chapter 4 and the verse is 12 up to 13. This is what we can read. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, according to Apostle Paul, the reason why there are ministers, there are shepherds, is because we need to equip God's people to do his work, build up the church or the body of Christ. According to the verse, this will continue until all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son. But I want you to focus on this. That we will be mature in the Lord. Measuring up to the, the full and complete standard of Christ. Meaning that is something that should be the end goal of any Christian. Any follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. Any disciple. To measure up to the full 
and complete standard of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning when you have reached that standard, you will be qualified for salvation. So beloved brothers and sisters, if that is expected from the members, from those who belong to God's nation, or those who are considered God's people, much more that is expected from the ministers, from those who are leaders of the church, from the executive minister himself. What is that? To be mature in the Lord. So that is something that we can pray to our Lord God for Brother Eduardo V. Manalo, to be able to reach that standard of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to reach that maturity in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we call the spiritual maturity. Now, aside from that, what else is uh, expected uh, to be reached by anyone who is considered a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ or to be part of God's nation? Let's read what's written here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and the verses 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Not only are we expected to be spiritually mature, we are also expected to be what? Mentally mature. In our thinking, in our perspective in life, how we treat people, how we speak, how we act. Those are the things that our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ expects us to be mature, not to be like children. Why? What, what does it mean to be like children? Do you, do you remember when we were children? Like say, for example, if if you are upset with somebody for children what was that uh, tagalog term matampuhin do you know that term matampuhin um, they're they're easily upset offended and once they are upset or offended it will take time before they actually forgive uh, the person that they're upset with they easily get offended like that and another thing is, if uh, a child is mad at somebody, what does he expect from his friends? That they too will be mad at that person. So, papipiliin nila, o mamili ka, sino sa amin? Doon ka sa kanya o sa akin? They would let their friends choose sides. Because if you choose his side, then you're not my friend. It's the mentality of children uh, um, how do you say that? Um, uh, dahil sa hindi, hindi tayo bate, dapat hindi rin kayo bate. You know that uh, kind of mentality. So they're thinking if um, if they they um, they don't like somebody, their friends should also not like that person. So is that something that we can see in the current situation right now? Let's say, for example, those who are still inside the institution, if they are um, to be ordered to refrain from speaking to those who were expelled or those whom they call as defenders, uh, that they should avoid them. If they're living in the same house, they should kick them out. Or if they're even family members, they're not supposed to talk to them, not even care for them or support them or in, have anything to do with them. That's the kind of mentality that we can see and feel and have experienced by many, especially in the current situation that we are in. That is why a lot of children nowadays have fallen victim to this crisis. Many of them do not understand what happened. Many of them have been um, collateral damage to their parents or anybody in their household who stood up for what is right, began asking questions, and demanding answers and um, making a stand not to participate in any evil works of darkness. And because of that, they have been expelled and that includes their whole household, even the young ones, the children who are not even aware of what's happening. Now, let's ask the Bible. What is the message of our Lord Jesus Christ to each and every one of us, each and every one of us, including the executive minister who's about to celebrate his birthday. Let's read what's written here in 1 John chapter 1 and the verses 5 up to 7. 
This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. We are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What is the message from our Lord Jesus Christ? In order for us to have fellowship, membership with our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, it is not predetermined whether you still have that name tag, you still have that toga, you still are able to access the pathway or doorway going inside the chapels or have access to the programs inside the institution. The determining factor, whether we have fellowship with our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, is if we are living in the light. So there are two kinds of lives we can choose from. Whether you want to live in the light or you want to live in the spiritual darkness. So if I were to ask you, beloved brothers and sisters, right now, where do you want to live? Do you want to be in spiritual darkness or you want to be living in the light? No, probably it's a very simple question that probably demands a very simple answer. And most of the time, our answer would always be, yes, I want to be living in the light. But remember, God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. And if a person says that he has fellowship with God, but continue to live in darkness, then he is only lying. If he say that he, is, he has fellowship with our Lord God in heaven. Now, other people may be defensive right away when they start you know, uh, hearing these things they would probably say that that does not apply to us. Why? Because we're not expelled. We're still members of the church. We're still, we still have our names in the registry. We're not the ones who were uh, announced during worship service as the expelled people for um, going against the church administration. So that's their fallback position. That's their safe ground, knowing that they are still inside the institution, registered in the registry in the secretariat office. They have their name tags and all of that. That would equate for them that they are still living in the light. Now, let's see if that is actually um, the be all and end all of being in the light or having fellowship with our Lord God in heaven. So our question is, if somebody says that it does not apply to him, because he's still a member of an institution or an organization or a church, let's ask the Bible then, what are the requirements for a person to truly say that he has fellowship with our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ? First John chapter 2 in the verse is 4. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, actually, what I said was wrong. This is one requirement that is required by our Lord God. Because a lot of people can claim that they know God, they follow God, that they will be saved, that they are the children of God, that they, are, they belong to the nation of God. But according to the verse, even if someone claims that, and utterly declares that I know God, but they don't, they don't obey God's commandments, the Bible says that person is actually lying. He is considered a liar. So the obedience that is expected from each and every one of us is not just mere obedience to any man. The absolute obedience that is expected is obedience to our Lord God in heaven. No, other people might say, I have no problem obeying God and his commandments. Actually, I, I have them on my wall. On especially the ones given by the ministers. 
They have no problem obeying that, especially the part about obeying the church administration. Their problem probably would lie on the enemies of the church, those who were branded as enemies, those who are considered to be um, dissidents, causing division. Now, because of this, it causes people to hate others. Like for example, if you are a member of the church, your faith would be tested by the ministers or the church administration if you are able to hate those who are hated by the executive minister. So if the executive minister hates and expels those who are asking questions, those whom they consider as going against the church administration just for asking questions or revealing uh, the anomalies inside the church, then for them, you are, if you are able to hate them at all, then you are considered faithful. And the, your, your faith is actually questionable for them. So let us ask the Bible, beloved brothers and sisters, uh, what is the correlation of having hatred in our hearts if we are to be followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue reading. We're in the book of 1 John. Let's read chapter 2 and the verse is 9 up to 11. If we say that we are in the light, yet hate others, we are in the darkness to this very hour. If we love others, we live in the light. And so there is nothing in us that will cause someone else to sin. But if we hate others, we are in the darkness. We walk in it and we do not know where we are going because the darkness has made us blind. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, we can see here very clearly the role hatred plays in the life of a Christian. Because the Bible says, if we say that we are in the light, that's, a lot of, that's the claim of a lot of people. They are in the light. They will be saved. They are the two Christians. Yet, they have the tendency or actually hate others. Then that would nullify everything they have said or everything they have done. Why? Because at that very hour, when they have hatred in their hearts, they are what? In the darkness. So if we love others, according to the verse, we live in the light. So once we have hatred, we are in darkness. Once we have love, we are in the light. So we have to always remember that. So if a person, whether he is a minister, going up into the pulpit, using the Bible, using the verses, yet he is spreading lies and hatred, then he is in the darkness. The question is, do they know or accept that they are in the darkness? The answer is no. They are in absolute denial. Why? Because the Bible says we walk in it. We do not know where we are going because the darkness has made us blind. They are blinded from the truth. Because of what? Because of hate, uh, hatred. Now, unfortunately, um, hating others seems to be optional for some people especially if you are a leader of a church. It seems to him, uh, it's an option whether he would love somebody or he would hate somebody. So let's ask, is, um, is loving somebody or loving others actually optional? We can choose to do it and, or not do it. Let's ask the Bible here in 1 John, chapter 1 in the verses 5 up to 7. This is what we can read. The message you heard from the very beginning is this. We must love one another. We must not be like Cain. He belonged to the evil one and murdered his own brother, Abel. Why did Cain murder him? Because the things he himself did were wrong. And the things his brother did were right. The Bible says we must, meaning it's a must. We must love one another. What is one example of a person who did not love others, especially his own brother? The Bible gave us 
an example, and it was Cain. You remember the story of Cain? He murdered his own brother, Abel. So the Bible says he belonged not to God, but to the evil one. Who is that evil one? Satan. So if a person would fall into hatred, then he would belong to the evil one. The Bible asked, why did Cain murder him? What's the reason? Because the things he himself did were wrong, meaning Cain was in the wrong. And the things that his brother did were right. So when one person is doing something right, the person who is not doing something right will hate the person who is doing something right. And that hatred can go as far as murdering somebody. Now, other people might say, or EVM might even say, I did not murder my brother. Well, technically, no. He probably just had somebody else do it for him. You know, the mere fact that Brother Angel was not only uh, accused of so many things, framed for a crime he did not commit, imprisoned, and was made to uh, languish in jail for such a long time, I think it's been, what, two years? Without any justice in sight? That is, for all intent and purposes, equivalent to murder already. When we say he did not do it and let other people do it, do you remember the organization that they have built? Do you remember that? Uh, couple of years ago when all of this started and um, things were being exposed on social media as a reactionary uh, effect. They created an organization called Mandirigma. Next slide. Mandirigma, for all, in, all intent and purposes, was an official sanctioned organization by EVM and the whole church administration. They even promoted it. They have their own logo, they have the thumb mark, they have everything. They, they, they even have their own uh, clothing. They have branded their own stuff. And they even celebrated, next slide. They even celebrated, I think this was a gathering by all the Mandarigma uh, leaders. Uh, there's Dolly and the others. And there's also ministers who were involved there. Next slide. I guess you, you would uh, remember Brother Arnel. Uh, his, uh, I think that's his son-in-law. And Brother Ramil Parba, there's Dolly, uh, very famous Dolly. So this is sanctioned by the church. And Mandirigma main sole purpose was to discredit Brother Angel, Brother Mark, Sister Tenny, and their whole family, and anyone who would go against the church administration. What was one of the landmark uh, achievements of Mandirigma? Next slide. When they call on, called all the, the brethren to unite with them against whom they call the fallen angels. And they proliferated social media with a lot of this stuff, this garbage. And they would post the face of Brother Angel and some lewd pictures. And they would, and this was posted by a minister, Brother Cesar Tangili. I, I know this minister uh, from way back then. Yeah, we were both assigned in Tandansora. This a very mild-mannered minister. Small, but mild-mannered. And I was so surprised um, to see him spreading this felt on his own social media. But I guess that was the measure of being a minister back then. You have to prove that you are a minister who's one with EVM if you can uh, stomach. Kung kaya mong sikmurain na gawin ito sa pamilya ng KRD. If you can uh, muster up everything you can just to spread this filth, then you have proven yourself worthy to be EVM's minister. So they have been spreading these lies about Brother Angel, that uh, they were uh, customers of, uh, what's that? Classmates. And they even have Dolly, 
who supposedly as uh, the whistleblower against them. And they would say, that's why you, you can see here, day 48, they were saying that they will expose and uh, release the video, the pictures, and everything that would uh, ultimately discredit Brother Angel. Uh, and this is what they have been saying all along. If we were to come from that day, 48 up to this day, I think we're already in the thousands. I, I'm not sure. But since the, the, the time they launched that campaign, that smear campaign against the family of Brother Eduardo Vimanalo to discredit them up to this very moment, nothing was ever revealed as their uh, evidence or their proof or the video that they were saying. Next slide. Remember the lies that that's, they spread also between brother, uh, brother Mark saying that he's the one who's ambitious to take the position of um, Brother Eduardo B. Manalo as the executive minister. And then they um, said that he had a mistress. Uh, the picture here is from our sister Marie Metano. She was one of the Mandirigma um, who was used by the church administration to front as the woman, supposedly the mistress of brother uh, Mark Manalo. So next slide. And this is uh, a picture taken inside the temple. That's Marie, that's uh, Dali. And because uh, Marie could not, could not believe that this is happening inside the church and the church administration is making her lie, she came out and um, confessed that all of the things that were brought out in social media by Dolly and the Madirigma were all scripted, they were all lies, and they were all meant to discredit Brother Angel and Brother Mark. So she said and categorically said that I was made to be the mistress of Brother Mark and that I conceived his child, and that is supposedly Urina to be their child. But again, none of those were ever proven because they were all lies. And unfortunately, a lot of our brothers and sisters inside the church bit into it. They believed those lies. Why? Because it was actually Brother Eduardo B. Manalo who sanctioned this, and he was even the one who spread it not only among the, the church administration, the ministers themselves, and even the church officers. If you want to know the whole story about that, especially those who may not yet be aware of what actually happened, you can go on YouTube and you can just search their Mandirigma no more. And you will see the series that were produced wherein Sister Marie confessed everything that happened or the things that uh, she was made to do when she was still a member of the Mandirigma. Again, there has never been any proof that they have been claiming. Next slide. So the video proof that they were saying that there were proof videos of um, Brother Angel and Brother Mark being in classmate until now, they cannot show not even one picture. Now, Brother Eduardo B. Manalo, you have known ever since that these are all lies. Why not come out and say the truth? Why not, according to our sister who wrote the letter, why not have the humility and the goodness of heart to come out into the open and say, those are the things were wrong. Those were um, concocted lies to spread, uh, to discredit my brothers. And you know, be the one, to be the bigger man, to extend your arm or your hand to your brothers, especially uh, Brother Angel who has been framed and is now languishing in jail. Why not come out into the open and admit, let's say, having the Airbus? Next slide. Remember the Airbus that they claimed that they never had? That they claimed that the executive minister did not ride the, the Airbus? And then one, uh, one of the worship service, he actually mentioned that he actually rode on an Airbus. And he has been riding the Airbus ever since. Not only him, his entourage, Glicerio Santos, and whoever wants to ride an Airbus. Probably if you write Brother Eduardo and ask, can I ride the Airbus too? Who knows? It's like writing to Wish Kulang. Wish Kulang. 
probably he would um, agree to it. But it's no lo it's not the VP CBE anymore. So it, as you can see here, it has been deregistered, and now the active one is VP CKQ. Wow, that's a, a nice looking Airbus. So again, why not come out clean, brother Eduardo? Probably in your birthday, that would be a good birthday gift to all the brethren. When you can finally come out clean and confess about the, these things, I bet the brethren would love you more. They would think Brother Eduardo had the humility at heart to finally uh, say the truth about the Airbus because they, they'll probably give more offering so that you can continue going around the world in an Airbus. They would want you to be in an Airbus, at least probably it's safer. So yeah, put it in your wish list. Must be something that you can admit to the brethren all over the world. What else? Next slide. While you're at it, why not uh, add the, the truth about the Philippine arena and the billion bank loans that the church uh, in the aid of Maligay Development Corporation, the Iglesia Ni Cristo Church of Christ, Felix Y. Manalo Foundation, New Era University um, have entered into an agreement to have a bank loan amounting to billions of pesos for the construction of the Philippine Arena. Then probably if you come out stating that those are all true, then probably the brethren would love you more because they would finally say, ah, finally, he has come out into the open and admitted about those bank loans. Now we can all chip in so that we can pay for the collateral, pay for the interest, and hopefully those collateral properties will not be taken by the bank. I think everybody would help out. So even Brother Glicerio Santos, uh, the fourth, who is the director who signed this promissory note, probably he would come out clean too if the executive minister himself would do it first. What else? Because of the things that all of this have proven, it only proved that Brother Eduardo Pimanale is not telling the whole truth. He is not in the light. Because if you are in the light, then you are in God's truth. But if not, then you are not in the light. Now, the thing that um, when this all happened, it was Brother Angel who went on television and said, that there is something wrong with the Philippine arena, that it should be investigated because, of course, um, it led the church to go into billion bank loans. So he was actually saying the truth. He was actually doing something right. And again, what the Bible said, if a person who's not doing something right saw a person doing something right, what will he do? He will go against that person. And if you cannot silence that person, or once he has already come out with the truth, the best thing you can do is to make sure he get punished for telling the truth. And what happened? Next slide. Brother Angel was charged. Look at this ammunition. Look at this ammunition. He was charged for possession all of that. The reason why they had to go that route is because this would constitute a non-bail status for his um, uh, charge. So if there's no bail, then you can go out of church. Meaning even if you are not guilty for as long as you don't have a hearing or a judgment and you are under no bail, you are good as guilty. Why? Because you're, you're in jail. You can't, get, you can't post bail. And they would do everything to keep Brother Angel in jail. What do you mean everything? Next slide. Even if there's a court hearing, it, get post it gets postponed and postponed and the judge will not grant any motion. So justice delayed is justice denied. Why are even the justices in Quezon City or anywhere else afraid to give Brother Angel the due process needed for his case? Because they're afraid. Of Brother Eduardo B. Manalo is very influential, very powerful, not only in the church, but also in politics, in the government. Ask any politician. If they want a seat in the government, 
they better be in the good graces of Brother Eduardo de Manala. So again, what was needed to put a good person in jail? Next slide. This was a report. Next slide. This was a report. Uh, let's read at the last two paragraphs. This is a 50 caliber sniper. This was done during an interview wherein they presented all the uh, munitions and the guns that uh, were supposedly um, gotten from the house of Brother Angel Manalo. Now, this is a 50 caliber sniper rifle. Typical, naginamit sa mama sa pano, ganito kalaki. You could just imagine yung tumama doon sa uh, special action force, police natin. Ganyang kalaki na bala ang tumama sa kanila. Original siya. Original. Phoenix, Arizona. He said during the March 9th press conference in Camp Karingal where the firearms were displayed. So again, they're painting a picture of how dangerous those guns were. Because they were the same uh, ammunition, the 50 caliber sniper rifle that were used in the Mama Sapano massacre wherein uh, police officers were killed uh, in cold blood. The last paragraph, Quezon City Police District Director Guillermo Elizar said that based on the law, it is not compulsory or mandatory to conduct paraffin tests anymore on Angel Manalo and the other suspects since he had claimed to be the owner of the area where the recovered firearms had been found on March 2. Now, I don't know if it need, uh, somebody needs to be a, what do you call it, criminology graduate to understand that this does not make sense at all. Meaning, if a gun was uh, seen or taken from a house or an area that you own, then does that mean automatically you are the person who is supposed to be held liable? if ever that firearm was supposedly shot uh, a police officer. So in fairness, in due process, if you really want to prove somebody guilty, you're gonna get a paraffin test. But for them, since he is the director of the Quezon City Police District, he's the one who said it's not compulsory, it's not mandatory. He immediately made himself a false witness to pin down Brother Angel Manalo. Why didn't they get a paraffin test? Do you know why? Because that would only prove that Brother Angel is innocent. If they wanted a close shot case, then it would have been so easy for them to get that paraffin test, present it to the media, provided it's not tampered, and then say, that's proof that he's the one who shot whoever got shot. We don't even know who got shot. We never saw who got shot. Just look at the police reports of all uh, police shootings. Whenever a police was shot, you would see the media all over it. It's on TV, it's on, it's on newspaper, it's on social media, and you would see them in the hospital or wound up. But with this, nothing. It's all hype, it's all drama but there's no proof. But because he is the top head of the Quezon City Police District, which mind you is just a few kilometers away from the, uh, the INC headquarters, meaning they, and, and almost, I don't know how many, but majority of the people who are either officers there in Quezon City Police District, they're mainly Iglesia Ni Cristo members, or they are beholden to the church administration. One, um, one quick fact. Um, anyone who works in the city hall in anywhere in the Philippines, the person who decides who gets appointed as the, Quezon, uh, as the police district in the district where the mayor is, is actually the mayor or the local government. They, they usually give three names it's called the shortlist. They give that name to the PNP and they would, or, or the PNP would give them three names, which is their communication back and forth. And then the mayor would choose. Now, who do you think will the mayor choose as the Quezon City Police District director? 
Would it be his choice or somebody more influential who put him in that position as mayor? Well, your guess is as good as mine. So again, a false witness was instrumental to put a good person, innocent person in jail. Now, why are we urging Brother Eduardo B. Manalo to come out clean? To quote his mistakes that he has done in the past so that he can pave way for the truth and people would be enlightened by the truth. Let's read what's written here in Proverbs chapter 6 and the verses 16 up to 19. There are seven things that the Lord hates and cannot tolerate. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill innocent people, a mind that thinks up wicked plans, feet that hurry off to do evil, a witness who tells one lie after another, and someone who stirs up trouble among friends. Now, of all the things that were mentioned in this verse, how many things do you think a certain person we know is actually guilty of? Probably of the seven things, he's guilty of eight. But all of these things, the Bible says our Lord God cannot tolerate. He cannot stand. And he actually hates. Why? Because these are the things that are evil in the sight of our Lord God. Now, what if EVM doesn't want to change? No, he is the executive minister after all. Who would dare challenge him? Who would dare say, Brother Eduardo Vimanalo, you need to change? I don't think anybody in his administration has the balls to even go up to him and say that. So what if, knowing that these are the things that our Lord God hates, yet he would still make a stand and will not change? Let's read what's written here in 1 John. We're almost done. Uh, chapter 3, 7 up to 8. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, meaning they did not stop, when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. So what is wrong? If somebody does not want to stop sinning, the Bible says when people keep on sinning, it shows that they do not belong to our Lord God. Who do they belong to? They belong to the devil. So that's why it's imperative. That somebody who is a leader of a church, organization, or people who claim to be the ones who will be saved should be the first one who would stop committing sins. Now, something is interesting happened today when somebody called me and asked me a question, actually an advice. He's not a member of the church uh, or the institution, but he wants to marry somebody who is still inside the church institution under Eduardo V. Manalo. Now, his question is, um, what will I do? Can I just go, to the, uh, go and become a member of the church? And then after, um, I would just stop attending worship service and even get expelled. And I said, so what's the point? of you going all through that only to just stop going to church and um, being expelled. And he said, because I know what the church is doing, meaning referring to Brother Eduardo B. Manalo and his administration. So I said, why are you still going to go through with it? Because he said, because he loved the girl. So I asked him, did you ask the girl, what if you don't comply to her demands that you will be a member of the church. They actually had that conversation. And that's actually uh, one of the questions he asked uh, to the girl. And the girl said he will not go through with it simply because he does not want uh, her parents to be expelled or have their tungkulin be stripped off from them because apparently uh, her parents are all um, officers inside the church. And if the girl were to be found to be dating a non-member, then there are chances that she will get expelled and they would be stripped off of their tungkulin. Now, 
The ironic thing is what the woman said, I mean, the girl, she said, once they get married, once he agrees for the agrees that they get married inside the church, the day after that, the baptism, the marriage, after that, then he can stop going to church. And then he asked, so that means I'm going to be expelled or taken off or be delisted. And the girl said, it doesn't matter for us as long as we, uh, I abide by my parents' rules that I should be married in the church and they will not be stripped of their kunkulin. And he was just flabbergasted knowing that uh, she knows that it's just going to be a hypocritical situation wherein he's going to enter the church or be baptized for them to get married only to leave the church afterwards. So I said, if you love the person, are you willing to go through all of that charade just for her? And then um, will she also be willing to do that for you? That's where he got stumped. He actually doesn't know the answer because uh, for him, I mean, for the girl, all, he wa all she wants is that she becomes a member, they get married in the church, and the girl doesn't even go to church regularly. So that's very ironic. But, you know, I, I asked what is the opinion of the girl about everything that's happening in the church? And he said, and she said, uh, she doesn't really care about it, but she doesn't want to associate herself with the enemies of the church, referring to us. So I said, does she even know any of us personally? And he said, no. So why would she hate us not knowing actually what really happened? And he said, that's just the way it is. So that's so sad, actually, knowing that a person is capable of hatred, even if he or she doesn't know what he or she is actually hating somebody for. But what is the problem about hatred? Especially if a church or a church administration or a leader of a church is teaching about hatred, not only that, setting himself as an example of somebody who's capable of hatred against his own mother, brothers or sisters, or anybody else who he deemed is going against him. Let's read what's written here in 1 John 3.15. Those who hate others are murderers. And you know that murderers do not, do not have eternal life in them. Next slide. What does the Bible say about hatred? Those who hate others are what? Murderers. Again, you don't have to own a gun or even a knife stab somebody in the back or the heart or actually kill a person literally to become a murderer because in the christian era the bible states that once you start hating somebody then you have become a murderer and being a murderer you are not entitled to eternal life anymore so if a person who is still inside an institution who claims he will be saved who thinks he is holy and righteous and qualified for salvation, yet he is qualified, or I mean, he is um, capable of hating others even without knowing why, then he has become a murderer in the sight of our Lord God. Now, other people might even think, maybe I can just love God. I don't want to love those people, especially those who are expelled, even if she is my own mother, even if he is or she is my own brother or sister. If they're expelled, I'm not going to love them. I'm not going to care for them. I'm not going to support them. I'm just going to love God. Is that possible? Is that an option we can choose? Let's read what's written in 1 John chapter 4, 19 up to 21. We love because God first loved us. If we say we love God but hate others, we are liars. For we cannot love God whom we have not seen if we do not love others whom we have seen. The command that Christ has given us is this. Whoever loves God must must love others also. So it's not, it's actually a deal breaker. You cannot say you love God and hate others. If you love God, then you must love others too. When they say others, it's regardless of who they are. They are your neighbors. There are other people. You have to love them the way it is commanded. And that is to love them the way you love yourself. 
So it does not discriminate when we are commanded to love others. Now, is there an example of this kind of behavior? When somebody would want all the attention and doesn't want you to love or help others whom he doesn't love or whom he hates. And if you don't follow him, then you will be expelled. Is there an example in the Bible? Something like this or someone like this? Let's read. Um, in the verses 9 up to 10. I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. Is there an example in the Bible? There's actually a splitting resemblance of what's happening now. There is a somebody, there is somebody who loves to be the leader, Diotrephes. He loves to be the leader. And according to the verse, not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. Now, these traveling teachers whoever they may be in another translation, they are strangers, but they welcome them. But Diotrephes, no, I'm not going to welcome them. I don't want to help them. And he wants others not to help them too. What if somebody helps them? What, somebody, what if somebody give assistance to them, especially like what happened to Brother Angel when they were in trouble? There were brethren who rushed towards central, gave food, water. What happened to them? They have been attacked. They have been harassed. What else? Just like what's written in the Bible, he puts them out of the church. There goes your express expulsion. So again, the Bible states that there is somebody who has the authority to put somebody out of church. He has the authority to expel somebody. So if that person has the authority to expel, then maybe we should follow him. We should follow him without question. Maybe we should have absolute obedience towards him, especially if he has the power to expel us. Let's continue reading in verse 11. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Next slide. Dear friend, don't let the, this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children, and those who do evil prove that they do not know God. So again, since we have been taught the pristine doctrines from the Holy Scriptures, especially during the time of Brother Ranyu G. Manalo, and even those who were also present during the time of Brother Felix Manalo, they already have the foundation of the doctrines, the Holy Scriptures. That's why even if there's somebody who's threatening you, if, that if you do good, if you help those others, then you will be expelled. The Bible says, your friend, don't let this bad example influence you. It's a bad example, actually. We should not follow it. What should we do? Follow only what is good. So what is bad? Don't follow it. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children, regardless if you get expelled for doing what is good. So that should be the stand of every Christian out there, regardless of your affiliation, regardless of um, who you are, where you are, what your situation is, for as long as we are followers of Christ, then our main objective is to do good to other people, even if we get persecuted and oppressed for doing what is good. Now, this causes a lot of people to be confused. The truth is a lot of people are actually conflicted. What am I going to do? Am I going to follow him who has the authority to expel? Or am I going to do what is good and follow my heart or the teachings that I have received and help those who are in need? Do good to other people, even if they're expelled. 
What should we do? Let's ask the Bible. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 up to 16. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us. Next slide. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ who is the head of his body. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love, not hatred, not persecution, certainly not oppression. So that's why as we grow, not only by age, but also spiritually, mentally, psycho psychologically, we should not be immature like children. We should have that spiritual maturity, mental maturity that is expected from each and every one of us. Yes, probably before we were immature. Probably before we have not reached that standard yet. But the Bible says we should no longer be immature like children. Tossed about and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We should not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So clever, so clever, they sound like the truth. Especially if they're the ones wearing the Americana, in the pulpit, using the Bible, they have the authority. Even if they have all of that, they may sound like they're speaking the truth. But what can we say about the truth that we should all speak? The Bible said, we will speak the truth in love. So if you're saying you're speaking the truth, yet what's coming out of your mouth is hatred, asking God to punish those people, asking God to kill them, make them perish, make them suffer, that is not the truth coming from our Lord God. So let us examine ourselves right now. Are we growing in faith? Are we going, growing more mature every day? Are we speaking the truth in love and growing in every way more and more like Christ? I think that's something that Brother Eduardo V. Manala should be focused on. Being more and more like Christ. Being Christ-like. Because we are followers of Christ. And remember, it is our Lord Jesus Christ who is the head of this body, the church, or the church of Christ. It's not Brother Eduardo V. Manalo. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. So anyone who belongs in that body should be more like the head. And the head does not hate other people. The head gave an example of a good Samaritan who helped somebody in need, not asking, wait, I'm going to help you. But wait, are you expelled? Are you a member of the church? Or you belong to that religion or that group of people? I want to help you, but I can't help you if you're not one with EVM. That's not how the parable goes. So we should be more like our Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody is teaching you more to be like Diophrites or somebody else who's not like our Lord Jesus Christ, then you will no longer belong to the body of Christ. You will not have fellowship with our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the people who spread lies and hatred are the ones who claim to be children of God. And they say that they are worthy of salvation. Is this actually true? Can we say that we will be saved and spread lies and hatred towards other people? Is this even possible? James 1 26. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is what? Worthless. It's worthless. Would you want anything valuable in your life to be worthless? Like, for example, the cash you are saving up for. If one day you realize that that cash that you've been saving for does not equate to any value, it's worthless. If the, the thing that you have been um, saving up for suddenly becomes worthless, it's meaningless. Much more if the religion that you have been fighting for, the religion that you are clinging into, 
protecting at all times would become worthless, then that would be meaningless in our lives. When would a person, even a religious person, become worthless and his religion becomes worthless when they cannot control their tongue from speaking lies, from spreading out hatred. Those are the things that will nullify our qualification for salvation. What would be the best advice we can give our fellow brother, Brother Eduardo P. Manalo, regardless of his past, regardless of what we are not to judge anyone. If we are to give an advice to Brother Eduardo B. Manalo for his coming birthday, what would it be? Let's get something from the Bible then. Let's read what's written here in Psalms 34, 11 up to 14. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn, turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. So I guess Brother Eduardo B. Manalo and his whole family wants to live a life that is long and prosperous. Then we should fear God, not man, or not the person who's going, who has the authority to expel. We should fear our Lord God. And that godly fear says we should keep our tongue from speaking evil and our lips from telling lies. So Brother Eduardo V. Manalo has the capability to stop the hatred inside the institution. He has the power to, to say during his worship service, mga kapatid, mahalin natin sila. Even if they say that we are the ones who committed a mistake. Mahalin natin sila. Patawarin natin sila. That would be a big step for him. Why? Because it is a step towards love, compassion, forgiveness. But the Bible says if we are to keep our tongue from speaking evil and our lips from telling lies, then we will have a long, a long life and a prosperous life. The Bible also says turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace. You know, if, if you're putting an innocent man in jail, devoid of any justice or due process, you will not have peace. Search for peace and work to maintain it. How about for those who have been afflicted by this crisis? Those who have been affected for standing up for what is right. Many of us have been displaced, scattered in different parts of the world. Our lives have been disrupted. Our families conflicted. Many of them are far away from us. Others are living in danger and fear because powerful people are always out to get us. What is the advice of the Bible for each and every one of us who have been afflicted by this crisis? Psalms 34, 15 up to 16. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. Next slide. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. Next slide. I think there's something wrong with. Next slide, please. Okay. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Let us not despair, beloved brothers and sisters, because our Lord God always watch over us. And he will do what is right. His ears are always open to our cries. And we know that he will always be there to protect and help us and guide us. So what is the obligation and responsibility of everyone who are already in the light? Those who have been enlightened, those who have freed themselves from hatred and evil works. 
Let's read what's written here in the last verse I will read to you. Isaiah 17, 117. Learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, fight for the rights of widows. This is what our Lord God expects from each and every one of us, especially as the, at this juncture of our journey toward salvation. There are so many things that happen, so many lives affected. But for those who continue to be in the light, we should try our best to learn what is good and seek justice for those who are victims of injustices. Let us help those who are oppressed and defend the cause of orphans. Let's fight for the rights of the widows, the fatherless, and anyone who is persecuted and oppressed. That is our plea. Next slide. To Brother Eduardo V. Manalo, our sister who wrote is correct for as long as we still have our life and strength. Next slide. We still have hope, positive change, and something that will be good for us. And that will come when we have a change of our heart to do what is right, to follow our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, thereby attaining that fellowship with him and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let that be our prayer, beloved brothers and sisters. Let us all stand and we shall pray. Our Lord God in heaven, thank you so much because we know that you are always listening to our prayers. We feel your presence in our lives. We know that you are always watching over us. We pray to you, O oh God, for all our brothers and sisters all over the world whose life, lives have been disrupted by this crisis. We know, Father, that these are all according to your plan. You are testing our faith to know if we will stand on your side or we will be succumbing to the fear of this world and those who will threaten our membership. Beloved Father in heaven, we pray unto you, please bless our brothers and sisters, especially those who are conflicted, especially those who are confused. Bring us all into the light. Let no one be left in the darkness so that come judgment day, we will have that assurance that we will be saved come judgment day. Beloved Father in heaven, we pray for Brother Eduardo V. Manalo. Let it be your gift to him that if it is according to your will, may he have a change of heart and a change of mind so that he may come out and proclaim your truth and be the one to help those who are oppressed. Be the one to stop the lies and the hatred and be the one to proclaim what is love and true in your sight. If it is according to your will, Father, we will follow you. We will continue to do what is right, even to those people who consider us as their enemies. Allow this message to resonate in the hearts of your children, wherever they may be, and allow it to be an instrument so that they too will know your truth and be in the light. Our Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much for always being there to intercede our prayers to the Father. And because of you, he listens to our supplications and forgive us of the sins that we have committed. Our Lord God in heaven, we are confident that you have heard our prayers for all of these things we ask and beg in the name of our Lord, Christ Jesus. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your faithful attendance to our Bible study. Please continue to share this um, video to our brothers and sisters wherever they may be through social media. You can email us also if you have any questions or concerns that you want to relate to us and the rest of the ministers. And uh, we also invite you to our worship services on the weekend uh, through Zoom 100-100-700. Again, um, next week we'll have another lesson will be for edification. Uh, let us invite uh, our brothers and sisters to attend so that all of us will be edified. Thank you very much. And this concludes our Bible study for tonight.